Hello there. <laughs> hey, it's Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be to create a business and life you love. Got a question for you today. Have you ever felt like you have a ton of potential inside, but you're not able to fully actualize it out into the world? My next guest says that the key to really unleashing your power, your voice, and your self-respect lies in one simple decision that you can make right now. We are about to talk with one of my favorite authors of all time, Mr. Steven Pressfield, about his new book called Turning Pro. I absolutely love it. I think that every human being on the planet should read it, and let's talk to him right now and learn why. All right, everyone, welcome. I am here with, as I told you, the amazing author of Turning Pro, Mr. Stephen Pressfield. And as you'll notice, my book cover is like all cranked out. Stephen, I've had this book at the beach. I can't even tell you how many people have stole it from me. There's like highlights, there's sand in this book. Um, ah, great. I absolutely love it. So I built up this book, which again, no hype. Everyone on the planet should read this. Let's talk about what turning pro really means? What does turning pro mean to you? The, uh, there are a lot of us out there, including me in the past, who are amateurs, who are living their lives as amateurs. And um, it's somebody that uh, wants to be a writer, but only dabbles once in a while and you know puts a few words on. Somebody wants to shoot film, somebody wants to be a painter, somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, and doesn't really get it going. And my, I think a lot of times when we try to ask ourselves, well, what's, what's wrong? What's happening that I won't let me do this? Okay. We, we can blame ourselves, you know, we think that uh, there's something wrong with us or we're sick or we have neurotic tendencies or whatever. My instinct about the whole thing is to forget all that stuff and just look at it from, through the prism of are we a pro or are we an amateur? And if we're a professional, then we don't accept any excuses from ourselves. You know, when, when the day comes, when we wake up in the morning, we don't feel like doing whatever it is we know we need to do, a professional gets up and does it. You know, Kobe Bryant goes to the gym, LeBron James goes to the gym, every a pro does what he has to do, whereas an amateur will crap out along the way, you know, they're a weekend warrior, da 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 da, da. So um, the, the whole point of the book, Turning Pro, is to try to make, to encourage people to make that switch in their mind. It doesn't cost any money. You don't have to buy any product. You don't have to take any course. Nobody gets rich off you or anything like that. Right. You, know? you right. just change your mind from being uh, from being a pro to being an amateur. I'll tell you a little story that we haven't even talked about, Marie. Right? I, uh, I had a woman friend a few years ago who took up golf. And, you know, people get bitten by the golf bug and they just go crazy, right? Yeah. And she had been playing for about a month. And she was absolutely terrible, of course, as anybody would be. So she invited me to come out and play golf with her. And when I showed up at the golf course, she was decked out from head to toe. She had the beautiful shoes. She had the beautiful visor. And she was terrible. It was terrible. And I said, what's the story, Kathy? You know, and she said, you know what, Steve? I decided to think of myself as a pro. She says, I know I stink, I know I suck, I know it's going to take me years, but I am going to take this seriously. I'm going to have the right gear. And she, she had got herself on a program of lessons, a program of practice, you know, where she put in X number of hours a day, and she was practicing the way a pro practices. In other words, not just doing the fun things, the glamorous things, right. but the boring stuff, you know, the three-foot putts and things like that. And, of course, within nine months, she was a good golfer. Now she's a terrific golfer. And I remember when she, when I first heard that from her, I thought, wow, that is really a wild idea. Um, and so that's an example of just somebody who just put the mindset in, I'm not going to be a dilettante, I'm not going to be a dabbler, I may be no good, but I'm going to commit to this full time, and she did. And that's, so that's what Turning Pro is. I love this idea, and I have to tell you, um, you know, you know, I'm a huge fan of the War of Art. I'm a huge fan of Do the Work as well, and we've done interviews in the past, which we'll put links below for all of you guys if this is your first time hearing Stephen and I talk together. Um, and I remember being struck in the War of Art by the idea of turning pro, and actually, I have taught and talked about it, always crediting you, of course, and like pimping out your book right and left, because <laughs> that the singular concept of turning pro, it's magical. It really is magical, and it informs everything that you do. One of the well, let me ways. Let interrupt you, Marie. I mean, yeah. we were talking about this before. Yeah. 
did you have a moment of, of turning pro? And if so, what was it? You know, I feel like, um, much like you, which when you read the book, you guys will know this, there was probably several moments. And then there was a, a period where I was like, I got to do this, you know, and it was like a training ground. And I think when I first started out and I knew that coaching and personal development and business growth, they were passions of mine. And I knew I had a message to share, but I wasn't quite sure how it was all going to fit together. You know, I was bartending a lot. Uh, that's how I was, uh-huh. you know, earned enough money to get my business going during the day. And I was writing my newsletters, but I thought they were crap, which I'm sure they probably were. <laughs> but I was just putting them out there. And I feel like I was almost like, I was like a baby pro where I would do the minimum work that I needed to do. But then I had so much fear and self-doubt. And, you know, I was in my early 20s and I would at the end of the night of bartending sometimes totally drink too much and be out until like three or four in the morning. You know what I mean? So it Uh was like I would have these levels of little wins and then I think it almost, there was like too much energy or I couldn't handle it or I wasn't willing to just really stay there and I would self-sabotage a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think... Was was there an actual moment that you... uh, That I decided that... Suddenly decided... You know, I feel like it was, I, I don't remember like an exact moment, but I do remember a specific period in my life. And it was when I met uh, my fiance, Josh, who um, I'm with today. We've been together for almost 10 years. And there was something around that period of meeting him when um, I really took ownership of my gifts and I stopped screwing around. Ah. And it was about that time that while I never had like a problem with drinking, the partying kind of went away. Uh-huh. Um, do you know what I mean? Like doing those stupid exactly. things that just throw you off track. Those things kind of melted away. And that was the time when I, I, run, I not coincidentally, started making more money, started um, receiving, you know, some opportunities that never seemed to happen before. Like things started lining up when I feel like I met him, I owned my gifts. There was something that kind of settled in myself. And while nothing started coming along easily, there was something that changed in me. And it was something about... Again, it was it was around that partying idea of not like just saying, oh, well, you know, who cares? I'll just stay out all night or, you know what I mean? I don't need to get to that newsletter in the morning. I can push it off to next week. Like I stopped doing those things. So I mean, in a way, what you're doing now, Marie, is sort of a form of partying, but it's kind of positive partying. That's you know? totally right. You know? that's- so it's it's not as though you went from... A to Z, it just, you sort of changed the metaphor a little, a little bit, you know, where you made it direct instead of indirect. Yeah, and I think it was also too, um, you know, you talk about this in a book a little bit, where, you know, you change how you treat your body, you change when you go to sleep, you change when you wake up, you change just how you approach everything when you're a pro. And there's this sense for me and my experience of, of just reverence and honoring the fact that I'm here for a reason. And I make a difference to other people, and that that's important. You know what I mean? And I can't yeah. just you know flitter that away. And so, well, there's a story we were talking about this earlier yeah. in in Turning Pro that I stole from Roseanne Cash's wonderful uh, memoir called Composed, mm-hmm. and it's sort of her moment of turning pro. And it takes a few minutes to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. It's yes. it was a dream that she had. And at this time, I think it was like the late 80s, and she already was a success. In fact, she had an album out called King's Record Shop that had four number one songs off of it. And, uh, but something didn't feel right to her in her life. And one night, she had a dream. And in the dream, she was sitting, she was at a party, and she was sitting on a couch next to Linda Ronstadt, who had always been kind of an idol of hers, yeah. and she had always admired Heart Like a Wheel and some of the, you know, the great uh, records that Linda Ronstadt did back in the 70s. And in between the two of them was an older man named Art, very important, and Art was talking very animatedly to Linda, and Roseanne wanted to kind of break into the conversation. She tried to. And Art just turned around to her in the dream and gave her this withering look of disdain and non-interest and just said, we don't talk to dilettantes. And Roseanne said she woke up, and she woke up and she was just shattered to the core. And she realized that it was true, that even though she had had these number one hits, that she always thought of herself as a songwriter, but she'd only written four songs on this album, and they were not the big songs. Hmm. So um, 
She said, from that day forward, just like you just were saying about how it changes when you wake up in the morning, yes, she yes. said she changed everything about her life. She got a, a singing teachers that she had never, you know, real technique teachers that, that she had never done before. She said she started training like an athlete. She began, began reading much in a much broader scope of all different kinds of art. She began studying painting so she could see what a, a non-verbal, non-musical medium was yeah. and kind of the... The, and she even her marriage even broke up if this uh, over this kind of thing, or at least eventually. Right. And but she just decided, I have to. I've been an amateur. I may have had success, but it doesn't feel good to me. And so she's kind of totally committed to songwriting and to learning. And she felt, she said, like she went back to being very young, like a beginner. Yes. And um, that was where she wanted to be. And I forgot what the last line of the thing was. Something like. I traded the morphine sleep of success for the live wire world of, of the artist. Mm. And so that was a, that to me is like a great turning pro moment in a dream. Didn't even have to be, you know, like waking up drunk in a gutter somewhere or something. Yeah. It was just a dream. I so. love that. I, that's one of my favorite stories in the book. And I think one of the other ones, and I, I would love to, to ask you about this. You know, you talk about the moment in New York City for you when you were driving a cab and you're in a, an apartment and you just couldn't take it anymore and you had to write. <laughs> and and then what I loved, and you painted this picture so beautifully, was like you wrote for a little while and if I remember correctly, it wasn't like it was necessarily any good, but you didn't care. You just actually had beat resistance and you sat down and you wrote. And then you almost found yourself just like cleaning the dishes, like dirty dishes that were in there for like 10 days and you were whistling. It was like something had broken through. You had broken through your resistance. Yeah, that was kind of my sort of moment. It wasn't as much fun as Roseanne's moment, but right. that was preceded by me trying for years to write novels and always crapping out at the on the one yard line, you know, and exploding my life, self-sabotaging and all that. And I, I had reached the point where the idea of sitting down at a typewriter was like just to me was like shooting myself in the head. Right. But this one particular night, I just uh, like you were talking about partying. I just kind of sat there and I thought, well, who can I call? Where can I go? What can I drink? What can I smoke? You know. Right. And I finally just said, I just can't do this. And I sat down for two hours typing. Terrible. So I just threw it away. You know. But that wasn't the point. It was just when I was finished, I actually felt okay. And that was why when I was washing the dishes, after that I discovered I was whistling, which I never whistled. And I thought, I feel okay. And, and that was kind of told me I was going to be okay from then on, even if it might take me another 30 years yeah. to do anything good, at least that I was going to be okay. So that was my kind of, uh, that was my moment. That was really cool. And then you wrote about, um, in another section of the book, about your year of turning pro. What I loved about that, and I'd love to chat about that for a moment, is, you know, this idea of turning pro, it's a decision that we make in a moment, yet it's a decision that we have to recommit to each and every day and develop that habit. So how is that year for you? That's exactly, you hit the nail on the head there, yeah. right? Because there is, there's that, it's like a moment of saying, I'm not going to drink anymore, right? You go, oh, wow, this is fantastic. But then the next day, you know, so uh, I... For me, I, uh, my white whale was to finish a book, to take it from page one to the end, which I never had been able to do. So I saved up all my money, the short version of it, and I moved to a little town in Northern California, and I just had a year where I didn't see anybody. I had like, you know, no sex, no sports, no TV, no music. I was like Rocky. I would get up in the morning, I'd have a breakfast of liver and eggs, you know, and, and, uh, and um, it was just me and my little cat, my cat Mo. And uh, but it was great because it was a year when I'd had no distractions, and I could just focus day after day after day. And when you do that, as you know, you know energy concentrates around you, and you become a really a different person. Yes. And uh, when I finally actually did finish it, and it never sold, you know, and the two books after that didn't sell either. But at that in that year, I really knew that I had become a pro, that I could do it, you know. And uh, so it's great beyond that initial breakthrough to be able to establish the habits 
of a professional instead of the habits of an amateur. Yeah, and I uh, love the that. amateur's habit is as soon as any adversity shows up, the amateur just falls out, right? But the pro, when adversity shows up, keeps going and just builds that as a habit. Yes, and many, many, many other habits like that. Yeah. I love that. And it reminds me, too, of the story you told in the beginning about your friend where she bought all her gear. Like, I love that. Just, you know, getting on the gear and going, I am committed to this. You know, the bumps are going to come. The obstacles are going to come. But a professional doesn't run away. A professional stays, does the work, gets it done, shows up the next day. Here we go again. And that actually, Marie, that leads to another uh, really important concept here, I think, is that, like, when my friend bought all this golfing gear. Yep. She really put herself on the line. She put, there was risk now because if she was lousy, people would say, what an idiot out there dressing like, you know, Annika Sorensen who, you know, can't, you know, hit the ball off the tee. Right. So it's the same thing when you mentally, I think a lot of the, re the reason why a lot of people remain amateurs is it's a, it's a way of protecting yourself where you say, okay, I failed, but, you know, it was because I didn't really try that hard. Right. You know, if I really had tried, I could have done, you know. Right. So when you commit in your mind as a professional, now if you fail, you're going to really feel it. You know, you say, man, I gave it everything I had, I still, but of course, the, the real answer to that is that it doesn't work that way. Once you commit, you get so much power out of that, that even if you fail, you just dust yourself off and you say, hey, that was just one shot, I'm going to try it again. And you've, you've established the habits of a professional. And that's the most important thing. Success, in my opinion, will come over time if you just have, you know, make it, create a practice for yourself in whatever it is. Yep. And just keep doing it and keep doing Dedicate yourself to it. Really take it seriously. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I seriously, I've reread your books, I don't know how many times. They're like soul vitamins to me. Uh, it's really good. So, um, one of the things you talk about on page 73 in Turning Pro, which I think is so vital, and it's something I hear from our community all the time, is what happens when you turn pro in terms of who you spend time with and who wants to spend time with you, and how everything starts to shift or can start to shift underneath your feet when you start making these changes. Did you experience that in your own life? Like, was there Definitely, a, and I yeah. see it in, in other friends of mine as I watch them kind of turn pro. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, did you ever see the movie a couple of years ago called The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg yes. as a boxer? Love. Now that's Love. like a classic story of this guy who has real talent as a fighter and his entire family is just sabotaging him. You know, his mom is his manager, his brother is this crazy, you know, ex-fighter. Everybody's just trying to bring him down because his success would be a reproach to them. Yes. Because they, uh, so when you turn pro, if you're a writer and you suddenly start to really write, um, your friends are going to try to sabotage you. You know, I hate to say it, but even the, close, the people closest to you, because they like you just the way you are. You know, they like you, you know, getting stoned with them or whatever amateur habits you have. Yes. And uh, if you suddenly start taking something seriously, they're not they're not going to like that. I have a I have a friend right now who is um, really kind of committing as a writer. Yeah. And, what's, and he has some friends who are kind of wealthy. And what they're doing to him, it's amazing to see. He's totally aware of it. They keep inviting him to Hawaii and to, <laughs> you know, you know, and uh, you know they would never cop to it. But they're trying to sabotage him, you know? Right. And he's actually struggling with confronting them and making them take him seriously. Yeah. You know, they're going to have to switch how they see him. And uh, so, yeah, when you, when you turn professional, there are some people that you have in your life now that you're not going to be able to have. Right. But, yeah. but you'll make new friends. That's right. That's new really friends right. come into your life and they recognize your commitment and... Uh, you know, the universe draws them to you and draws you to them. Yeah, it's so... Have you found that, Marie, yourself? And your oh, my goodness. Well, I've found just naturally, and I think, you know, an important note for me, at least, this has been my experience, it's hardest always in the beginning. And once you kind of make that switch and you turn pro and this becomes your lifestyle and, and it's consistent for the most part, it's like it's only that initial shift that's hard, you know. But once yeah. now for me, I would say, you know, I'm probably at least 10 years in, I don't have anyone in my life, thank God, I'm like knocking on everything, 
like they fully get who I am. They fully get I'm committed. And if I say no to a social engagement or I say, no, you know, I got to get home early. I've got, you know, this thing we're creating in the morning. We have, a, you know, two days of shooting Marie TV in the morning. Like they get it. They honor that. You're like, girl, get home. You got to get home and do your thing. And, you know, it's a, it, there's a blessing there. Um, but I think it was, I think it's more so in the beginning. You know, if you've had kind of habits going for a while and you've had a crew of friends or people are just used to you treating yourself a certain way and then all of a sudden you change, it's like that transition period I think is is the hardest. And yeah, for me, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. But then once you kind of amass your, your new posse and your new crew and, and you kind of become that different person, you don't really have to deal with it as much. You know, it seemed to eat Sure, you have people that now yeah. try to enter your life and you can sort of see that they're not going to be good for you. Am I right? And you kind of block them out right right away. Don't take the hook and get involved in any way. That's 100% right. I think it's also really important um, as creators, right, to, to take a look at that through even opportunities. You know, sometimes people, I'm sure you'll, you'll have opportunities come into your email box or your agents or anyone and say, hey, would you like to get involved in this project? Or, hey, would you like to come to this conference? Or, you know, do this or speak hey, here. You're absolutely that. right. And it's so opportunities can really be traps. Yes. It's not the right opportunity. Yes. And I think that's another form of it where, you know, um, things can look shiny on paper or look like they'll be like this great big thing for you. But when you're a pro and when you have your priorities straight, there's this great quote that I love, you know, priorities um, equal prosperity. And I think it's by a woman named Michelle Singletary. And, ah, um, ah, you know, heard. priorities are clear. Everything else becomes really simple. You know, all of those yeah. opportunities, you don't feel like they're shiny objects that could save you because yeah. you, you know your path, you know your method of creation, and you know what's going to get you the results that you want, the spiritual results, the, you know, creative results, the satisfaction, the work yeah. that you're meant to do. Yeah, very, very true. And as these opportunities appear, I, I've, I've been struggling with this myself, yeah. you know, the last couple of years where things come in and they're like you say, shiny objects. You go, oh, wow, that really sounds great, you know, and then, then you take, you say yes to a few of these things and then you get in and you go, oh my God, why did I do this, you know, and you, you sort of begin to define yourself and, and like, like uh, that quote about priorities, you kind of ask yourself, what is important to me, you know, yes. is making a quick, you know, a few thousand dollars important? No, it's not, you know, or... Um, and uh, so it is a process of evolution, of understanding who you are and what is important to you. Speaking of that, this is the perfect segue to, I think, talk about your publishing company, right, with your partner, Sean, Black Irish Books. One of the things I found fascinating when we were um, having our email exchange, I didn't realize that Turning Pro, that you guys published this yourself. And I know that you've You've done so many things. I mean, screenplays and other types of books and movies and everything. Um, but now you have both the experience with traditional publishing and self-publishing. Talk to us a little bit about that. What? Why did you make that choice? Well, I'm not sure, Marie, if my uh, experience will apply to a lot of other people because the the um, – like right now, I'm working on a big book, and I'm doing it with a traditional publisher. Yeah. And I always would do that. Yeah. I'm only a believer in self-publishing in for like for me for the War of Art and for Turning Pro because it, it it makes sense for me on those books. Yeah. The reason is that I was getting screwed so badly by the publisher mm -hmm. of uh, which everybody does because the 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 uh, the share that the author gets is so small. Right. It was a no-brainer. When uh, the, the War of Art had a 10-year contract and when it ended, Sean said to me, my partner said, let's just publish this ourselves. So instead of getting 35 cents a copy, we'll get 350 a copy. You know? And instead of on the e-books where you get like nothing a copy, you get you know, at least a certain amount. Of it. So that was pretty, pretty uh, important. And it's great fun to do it, you know, to have control. It's not that difficult. I'm sure you know this yourself. Yeah. To print books or to do e-books, it's not that hard. It's just a matter of, you know, hooking up with the right people and know how to do the technical stuff. But I, I'm, not sh I'm not sure I could really give advice to someone like a first-time novelist or a first-time uh, writer of nonfiction. Uh, it's That's certainly... Okay. 
I think the, it's just I think it's just interesting and cool that we have these possibilities today. Absolutely. Right? And if you don't mind giving up the dream of making a fortune, if you're willing to sort of live out in the long tail, you know, where you don't sell so many, but where you control your own destiny, then there's there's a lot to be said for this kind of thing. My I have a niece, my niece Laura is like twenty two years old yeah. and she has written four books that are in the kind of um uh like Twilight in that area that, which that last <laughs> are Tales of Arabia, The Last Witch, Laura Friedman. And she publishes it herself and she's got a following, you know? And uh, so, uh, you know, she's not getting rich, but it's certainly something that she's out there so somebody could discover her. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm all in favor of the bearish entry of Fallen a lot, but I don't think you're going to get rich doing it. It's not the answer to anything. You still... A book's got to be great for it to get out there, where whatever it is, or or a song, or an album, or whatever film. Yeah, no, it's. I think it's awesome. I've done both as well. I've done the. Uh, I actually started off self-publishing my book, and then we wound up selling it to McGraw Hill, and um, really grateful because it's in like eleven languages. But people have been on. Thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> uh, for the past few years. Like Marie, where's your next book? Where's your next book? And I have so much fun with video and I create digital courses and digital programs where it's like I have complete control. I can be the crazy creator that I am and no one is telling me what I can or can't put on any cover. <laughs> like it's yeah. just – and I think there's many of us out there that, um, you know, this is a really exciting time to live in. And you don't – what's really cool is you don't necessarily have to choose. You can live in both worlds or several worlds and use it um, yeah. in a way that works best for, for the content, for the medium, and, you know, strike the deals that, that are going to make the most sense for everybody. And the, the other thing that nobody talks about about self-publishing is that you – when you're published by a mainstream company, or I'm sure this is true if you're on a label, if you're a band or something like that, there's certain things, a lot of things, they won't let you do to promote your own stuff. For instance, they won't let you give away stuff. They won't let you give away the book or give away the song because they their model is the scarcity model. Right. Where it's everything you, when you give away, every unit you give away is a unit you don't sell. Right. Or some completely from the other school, which is, the real problem is anonymity. Right. Nobody knows you're there. Right. So if you give away 10,000 units, at least 10,000 people now know who you are right. or have heard of the thing. So that's a real, it's beyond just carrying, controlling your cover art or anything like that. It's that you're, you're allowed to do to work for yourself yes. because the mainstream big business model, they won't let you do it. I think, have you also too, the other, one of the other things that always struck me as a little odd and I got a little protective um, was the fact that I wasn't going to own my own content. I was like, what are you talking about? I wrote it. <laughs> I was like, I really would like to be able to do other stuff with it because I think it's good. And, you know, a, yeah. lot, a lot of the older traditional deals sometimes it's, you know, that's what you're selling them is, is your content. And if you have creative ideas about how you'd like to turn it multimedia or other things, it can just get really hairy. And I always say, I'm like, I am such a control freak. People always tell me with Marie TV, they're like, don't, why aren't you on regular television? Don't you want your own TV show? I'm like, I have my own TV show. It's this. <laughs> uh -huh. I can control anything I want. I can say anything I want, and we can do anything we want. Not to say that you know it won't expand at some point, but you right probably now, will have your own TV show. You know, it, but it's it, that's I think what's so miraculous about our time and to be creators at this point on planet Earth is the incredible options that if you do want to turn pro, you have something to create: music, fine art, books movies, you know, anything, a business, whatever you want to create. It's like what you're saying, the barriers to entry have become so low that now the real work is the inner work is to overcome yeah. those inner well demons. Put, right? yeah. 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 Really, really exciting. So Stephen, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I know you are a busy man, but what we love to do, which I told you about on Marie TV is always challenge our audience. And if you guys have gotten um, some good stuff out of this conversation with Stephen, remember you have to get this book. I have two of them in my house and I'm sure I'm going to be giving away more. Um, we'll put the link to Black Irish Books below this video so you can go right there and get it. Um, what we want to do is is talk a little bit about habits, right, Stephen? I mean, you say that the difference between an amateur and a professional really is 
in the habits. Their habits, yeah. A pro has professional habits and an amateur has amateur habits. That's right. And we all have habits since we're human. That's the majority of kind of how our lives run are our habits. So it's not like we can get rid of them, but we can upgrade them. So what Stephen and I want to challenge you to do right now is to take a look and take a look within yourself and see, do you have an amateur habit that right now you are willing to commit to upgrade to a pro habit? What would that one habit be? Almost like a keystone habit that would change everything. And write about it in the comments below this video. I, for one, am very interested to see because I think there's gonna be some very juicy stuff. And I think all of us have it. I'll take, I'll take a look for myself as well and see if there's any amateur habits still lingering around that I can upgrade. Do you like that, Stephen? I like that. All right, actually, good. thinking about my friend that turned pro as a golfer, even when she was lousy. Yeah. I mean, really, what she did was she kind of committed to professional habits. And she said to herself, I'm going to practice, you know, every day. Yes. I'm going to practice the right way, yes. et cetera, et cetera. So she traded in amateur habits for professional habits, and it, and it worked for her. Yeah. So we're excited. I want to see everything you have to say. As always, if you like this video, like it and please share it with your friends. And of course, if you're not watching this on MarieForleo.com, all the good action happens in the comments back on MarieForleo.com. So get your butt on over there and join us because the discussion is rich. If you're not yet on the newsletter list, please join us. Once again, you'll see that at MarieForleo.com. And Steve, thank you so much once again for coming on Marie TV. You are thanks, awesome. Marie, thanks for having me. It's great fun to talk to you and uh, get into this whole uh, thing here. It's great. All turning pro. Okay, you guys. Keep party. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> thanks, All right. Everybody. Thanks, Marie. Bye. B-School is coming up. Want in? For more info and free training, go to joinbschool.com. My dress is so French. My dress is so French. I did done it. I did 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 done it. Did it done it done it done it. I did done it.